Uh, it's 902 ish. Yep, 901. Yeah, we're getting to 902. So I'm going to get the lecture started. Um, I will pass the row sheet now, you know, because before I forget, because I tend to forget about this sort of thing. So there you go. Just put your name next to, put the initial next to your name, and then we'll get the class started. Right. So we got, um, uh oh. This is the other class, right? This is one, two, four, two, nine. I think this is the Tuesday, Thursday class. And we go to modules. All right. Well, because of Monday being a holiday, you guys are now you know having a chance to not only catch up, but to overtake the other class. <laughs> <laughs> but they will do the same thing again you know, when we get to, I think, Thanksgiving, because you know, Thanksgiving is on a Thursday. <clears throat> All right. So I got some additional modules added here, uh, one additional homework, and I also added the assigned value representation, which is basically what we talked about last time. Um, that's not added really new, um, but this is new. Binary number comparison is going to be the focus of today. Because we talked about you know how you know whether something is signed or not, really does not, it doesn't matter. Why do you care if addition works the same way, subtraction works exactly the same way, every circuit you know works exactly the same way? Why do you care? The only time you care is when you compare. Then it makes a difference. Okay, is one 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 as a Fourier number? Is it less than zero 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 zero? Okay, it's a trick question is a bad question. Because the correct question to ask is, is the value represented by 1111 less than the value represented by 0000? zero, 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 zero. Now, zero, 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 0000, we kind of know it's representing the value of 0. We got it. How about 1111? You guys remember the number circle from last time? So 1111 can represent 15 or negative 1. Okay, so then you have to make a decision and go like, okay, I want one by one, one, one to be representing negative one here, okay? Or I want one by one, one, one to represent 15, depending on the context, okay? So that whole idea is C and C++, where you have to declare the type, you have to determine, you know, I is signed or unsigned by the time you declare the variable. It's not how we are gonna do things in assembly language programming. We just defer everything until we actually get to compare, you know, to comparing the variable. Then we have to decide, oh, is this supposed to be signed or unsigned? Okay, so a lot of concepts that you learned, correct and healthy concepts that you learned in C and C++ programming is going to work against you in this class. <laughs> so the better, the more well, well versed you're with C and C++, it might work against you in this class. So you just have to kind of keep that in mind, okay? At the lowest level, things are very different, okay? <clears throat> so before we get to uh, binary number comparison, let me just kind of quickly switch to the ho new homework assignment, which looks awfully like the other one. And that's because it is exactly like the other one, except I replaced addition with subtraction. I replaced sum with difference. And I replace a few terms, you know, in the whole description, and that that was it. Okay, so you can potentially use your own design for this homework assignment that was due five minutes ago um, as a basis, or you can use my solution. Okay, I'm going to work on my solution in the lab um, in the lab session today, and I'll give you my solution. You can use that one as a basis for the new homework assignment. Is that okay? Is that fair enough? Okay. But I'm not going to upload that file. In other words, you know, you can watch it from the video or you can watch it you know, during the class time, but I'm not going to upload the file just so that you can do some minimal changes and turn it in. 
I, I mean, if I were you, I wouldn't feel good about that either. I, mean, I, want, I want to be able to work on it myself. <clears throat> so that's your homework. You have one entire week to work on it. Uh, so the due date is September 12th, which is one week from today, at 9 a.m., right before class. 9 a.m. PST. Because I don't want someone to tell me, but it's 9 a.m., you didn't say anything about what time zone. No, it is Pacific time zone. <clears throat> All right, so there's that. So now we can you know, kind of shift our focus to binary number comparison. And also, I just want to see if there are any questions about <clears throat> the whole discussion of um, CISC versus RISC. Are there any questions you know, from that little discussion of you know, why RISC is actually better in almost every single in every single respect, uh, respect, except for one thing, backward compatibility from Microsoft's perspective. <laughs> that was the only thing, right? That was the only thing, that's the only reason why we still have CISC processors inside these boxes. There are no other reasons. So did everybody get that point? Is anyone planning to uh, move up to Washington and someday and work for Microsoft? I guess you know if you okay don't don't let me you know, stop you from doing it <laughs> it is good experience it is a very good company to work for um, you know especially if you want to build up your resume I mean that's there's no better way to do it but you better do it fast <laughs> All right, and I'll tell you why you want to do it fast um, if you look at Microsoft what are the main uh, products of Microsoft that makes money Microsoft Office and Windows. Windows and there's one more thing that is most people don't see it, but you know if you're in the business world, Xbox, you know, SharePoint. You know ex well SharePoint and Exchange. Okay, so it's their server platform for you know exchanging information and whatnot. On all of these things, you know, me seeing a lot of pressure from competition. Microsoft Office, what kind of pressure is it seeing? Google Documents, right? Google Documents. Okay, you know, if you want to share a project, a writing project with somebody using you know, Microsoft Office, the installed version, it is a lot of hassle. But if you move it on to Google Documents as a cloud platform, you guys can work on the same document at the same time, leave comments, chat at the same time. So it's really easy to co collaborate with someone using that particular platform. Microsoft Windows. We're moving everything up in the cloud. Who cares what operating system you're using? Does it make a difference whether you're using Linux, using Mac OS X, or whether you're using Windows when, when everything is up in the cloud? You just need a browser to get to it, okay? So the operating system is not really that important anymore except for gamers. But even for gaming, what is the direction that people are heading? Steam is moving in which direction? On They're moving on to Linux, right? Steam OS is basically Linux, you know, on top of a few things, on top of a few things. So there's no reason to be stuck with a particular operating system anymore. So the only thing that Microsoft still has, you know, to hang on to, you know, their current customer base is Exchange, which is the email, you know, server. And a lot of corporations are not changing to Gmail for one reason or another. But that's the one thing you know, that, that Microsoft is really hanging on to um, for its own survival. If you look at Windows, what is the biggest change from Windows 10, uh, of Windows 10 from Windows 8? Uh, did you start okay, so uh, <laughs> does, it, does it change any functionality? It's always online now, which it can be very annoying to, okay, because your operating system, if you cut it off from the internet, certain things don't work anymore, okay, but in Linux, you know, I can say, okay, you know, most things will continue to work, certain things rely on, you know, internet connections, and I have control over that. I can say when to update and when not to update the operating system. Yes? Uh, yeah, the, in Windows 10, they do more background updates, which is not so bothersome sometimes because they mm -hmm. still, it's there. But you don't get to control as much anymore. 
they, they took that control away. So, so from one version to the next, you know, you're not seeing a whole lot of functional differences. So that's why, you know, I think, you know, that's, that may not be a very sustainable business model. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> not anymore. Used to be. So getting back to our boring stuff, we're now talking about comparisons. So we talked about this stuff already, and that's what led us into the risk discussion, is you don't need all six, you just need one, okay? The one that I personally you know, would prefer is just less than. Because from less than, you can have greater than, you can have less than or equal to, you can have greater than or equal to, you can have not equal to, and you can also have equal to. Okay? Now, granted, you know, every single time, if, you, if your programming language like C and C++ only gives you this and you have to turn that into this just to say that something equals to something else, it is a lot of hassle. But since your C and C++ programs are going through a compiler first to compile into assembly or machine code, which will do only less than, why, what do you care about, oh, there's only one single you know, comparison in the processor? You don't care because you, know, you can use the other five comparison operators the compiler translates for you. Does that make any sense? Okay. But in the process, we can save silicon, and as a result, we can improve the energy efficiency of processors, which is the bottleneck of how much processing power we can pack into those you know, uh, data center buildings. Okay, so we, we, we did that part already. So now we want to talk about you know, how do we compare numbers that use the unsigned interpretation. In other words, we look at 1, 1, 1, 1 as a 4-bit bit pattern and say that means 15. Okay, not negative 1, it means 15. So how do we do that sort of comparison? So ground rules, okay? I, I'm hoping nobody is going to question or to challenge the ground rules. 0 is less than 1. It's true. Okay, nobody wants to challenge that. Okay, very good. And conclusively, right? Conclusively. One is less than zero is false. Conclusively. Okay, there's no question about this. All right. But these are only useful certain times because remember, we are trying to perform multi-bit comparison or comparing multi-bit numbers. In other words, just being able to look at one single digit, one single bit, and say, oh, we know for sure that this bit is less than that bit or this bit is not less than that bit may not be enough. You also notice that I'm missing two cases here. What about zero versus zero? What about one versus one? Well, I'm not deciding yet because if it's a multi-bit comparison, just knowing that, oh, this is zero, the other one is zero, it is not less than, we cannot make a conclusion because we might need to look at the other bits of the same number to make that determination. Okay. So for the rest of the discussion, we are trying to compare x to y. In other words, the, the one thing we want to find out is, is x less than y? That's all we want to find out. We don't care about x is greater than or equal to y. We just want to know whether it is less than y or not. That's the only thing we are focusing on. <clears throat> and we also use the same kind of uh, symbol that we use from, you know, throughout the class up to this point. Uh, use a subscript i, in this case, xi is representing the i bit of x. Okay, then we count, start counting from zero. Okay, x zero is the least significant bit, which is usually on the right hand side. Is that okay? Are there any questions before we move on, just in terms of what is x, what is y, what we're talking about here? No questions? All right, then we'll move on. So using the signed representation, um, we know that xi is representing the quantity, or in this case, presence, of 2 to the power of i as a quantity of the value that we are representing. Do we have any questions about this? It's just how we represent values using a common base multi-digit number. Do you guys do remember that part? When we talk about, when I talk about you know, how the currency system is really convoluted and really hard to deal with, and yet you can deal with it you know, quickly, and this is much more consistent because we have one single common base so that each digit is indicating the quantity of each power of two in this case. Is that okay? 
Does anyone know why I put presence in parentheses instead of quantity? Because in base two, how many? What is the the largest quantity of a particular base of two that you can have as a base two number? One. What is the smallest quantity? Zero. So the bit is really indicating whether there is or there is not that particular power of two. If there is one, there's, there can only be one single, you know, power of two at that magnitude. Okay, there cannot be two because you know, you're dealing with a base two number. Okay. So we also want to establish this particular fact. Okay. Is everybody familiar or comfortable with the summation sign? Like this one, you know, where it says, you know, this is a summation sigma of i as an index variable going from 0 to n minus 1. But what we are actually summing are the individual terms of 2 to the power of i. So we are adding 2 to the power of 0 to 2 to the power of 1 all the way up to 2 to the power of n minus 1. Is everyone comfortable with the sigma or the summation notation? Okay, all right, cool. So now the question is, do we know this for sure? Okay, and most people would say, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, because two to the power of three, which is eight, is greater than two to the power of zero, which is one, plus two to the power of one, which is two, plus two to the power of two, which is four. One plus two plus four is seven, right? Eight is greater than seven, it's true, okay? So we don't need a proof. Or do we? Just because something works given a particular instance, a particular example, does it mean that it works in general? Nope. What happens when we overgeneralize from a few examples and go like, yeah, that works, let's move on. Somebody will find the error. Somebody will find the error. Some people, if the theorem doesn't hold, that means that anything that you build upon this particular false, the false theorem will run into a break wall at some point. Something is going to break big time, right? Okay. So we want to prove it. Okay. So this is how we prove this little theorem. Is how do we prove this? Okay. Now, just because it works for all the concrete examples we can come up with, is not sufficient to say that this works in general. In other words, you plug in n being 1, it seems to work. You plug in n being 2, it seems to work. You plug in n being 3, it seems to work. And you try everything up to 10,000, okay? It seems to work. Does it guarantee that 10,001 is going to work? Nope. Does not guarantee at all. So what you need to do is to go through a mathematical proof to get this done. Now, mathematical proofs is not uh, the focus of this class, but I don't want to overlook it either. Okay, because I want you guys to kind of start to think about, you know, rigorous proofs and not really just say that, oh yeah, yeah, it's given, okay, it's true, but I want you to kind of start to question things and go like, how do we know this is true? How do we prove something is true? So I'm going to prove this one. <clears throat> so what we do is we're going to use a technique called proof by induction. Don't worry, I will not ask you to prove anything in this class in the exams. But if you have taken CISP 440 already, or if you're taking 440 in the same semester here, whether it's with me or not, doesn't really matter, is that concept will be covered in CISP 440. And it's a very powerful proof technique they can use for a lot of different things. So we're going to use that technique. So the proof by induction technique says there are two steps. Okay, There's the base case, which basically means give me uh, one instance. Okay, where the theorem holds true. One single instance of n where the theorem is true. So I just pick, oh, let's take a look at you know, the case when n equals to 1. When n equals to 1, this is 2 to the power of 1, which is 2, right? On this side, you know, we only want to sum from i equals to 0 to n minus 1, but n is 1 already, so this is also 0. So we only want to deal with 2 to the power of 0 on this side. This sigma only has one single term, which is 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. 2 is greater than 1 is true. Okay, We have just proven the base case of proof by induction. So once the base case is proven, now we are dealing with the induction step. The induction step is kind of interesting. The induction step allows you to make an assumption. 
it says, you know, okay, let's assume the theorem is true when n equals to a particular k. I don't even know what k it is. Okay, the assumption is just saying, okay, let's just assume that it works for a particular k. K has to be greater than one such that this whole thing is true. Okay, you can see this whole thing is the same thing as the original theorem, but with n replaced by k. Okay, this is an assumption. But I'm going to say, with this assumption, can we show that it will work when we move it one step up? That is the question. That is the, the, the crux of the whole thing of proof by induction, is you can make the assumption that the theorem is true when, e, when n equals to k, but can we use that assumption to prove n equals to k plus 1? Is that okay? Does everybody understand the general idea of a proof by induction? Not so much the details, but just the idea. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the proof. So we start, well, I'm going to scroll as we go because I don't want to show you the entire thing because I, I just want to focus on one thing at a time. This is the theorem that we want to prove. Okay, We want to prove that 2 to the power of k plus 1 is greater than the <coughs> summation of i goes from 0 to k, 2 to the power of i. Okay? This is what we want to prove. So the next step is to break this up, break up the, the left-hand side. What did I do from step one to step two on the left-hand side? I changed two to the power of k plus one into two to the power of k plus two to the power of k. Is that okay? Because I separate one power of two to get out of the exponent, right? So it becomes two times two to the power of k but two times something is just that something added to itself, so it becomes two to the power of k plus two to the power of k. Is that okay? Nothing done to the right-hand side. Then I move on to the right-hand side and go like, hmm, oh, this is a big jump here. I really should not have done that. But what did I do to go from step two, the second row, to the third row? Are you using the base case? To, uh, well, but no, 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 not, not going from... Oh, no, no. So Going from the second row to the third row, what, what changed here? Why, why, why is one of the two the power of k disappearing from this side? And why did I change the index so they can now stop at k minus 1? Exactly, I subtracted a 2 to the power of k from both sides. Okay. So on one side, on the left-hand side, subtracting 2 to the power of k means one of them goes away. Easy. The right-hand side is a little bit more tricky because the right-hand side is a summation, so when you spell out the entire thing, it's really long, okay? But on the second row, if you spell out the entire sigma, it's going to have 2 to the power of k as the last entry. I just took it out. Now, when, once I took out 2 to the power of k from the sigma, now it can end at k minus 1 because the last term is subtracted. I'm just subtracting the same quantity same quantity from both sides. Is that okay? But that looks familiar to me because that is our assumption to begin with. Since it is already assumed true, it is true. And that's the end of the proof by induction. Is that okay? I know some of you have taken 440 already. Is this ringing a bell? Sort of? Is it giving you migraine again? <laughs> Headache? <laughs> but the more we cross over the classes, the more you can remember the concepts because it is an application of something that you, that you learn from another class applied to a different concept. So the more you practice, the more you see how it is, can be applied, the more you can remember and understand the concept. Well, that's my hope. <laughs> All right, so we have proven this little you know, theorem, a small theorem, also called a corollary. So now we want to move on, okay? So given that x and y have m explicit bits, okay, because you know, there are always an infinite number of implicit bits on the other side, okay? On the left-hand side, they're all zeros, okay? We assume xi equals yi equals to zero for i is greater than or equal to m. Okay. In other words, we are looking at a number that only has explicit bits to represent bit 0 all the way up to bit m minus 1. All the other more significant bits are assumed to be 0. Is that okay? 
because you can always pack as many zeros as you want to the left-hand side of a number. It doesn't change the value. So that's what this, this part is saying. And I'm going to use, I don't think it is actually used you know, in the notes here, but if, if you see something like this, it means we are only taking the chunk of a number from bit 0 to bit p, and that is this notation. So we are looking a, at a, at a sub-portion of a multi-bit number, but we are limiting which portion of the number that we are looking at. I don't think we I actually used this in the proof, but that's okay. You know, it's just an introduction to the concept. So let me see if you guys have any questions about the reasoning that I presented here. So when you get into this algorithm, we are going to make an assumption that x equals xi equals yi for i that is greater than p. And by the way, p starts with uh, m. Would that be OK? If p starts with m minus 1, is it OK for me to assume xi, you know, bit i of x equals to bit i of y for every single bit to the left hand side of bit m minus 1? Would that be OK? Yes, because it's 0, right? Because they're all zeros. OK, very good. OK, so, so remember, you know, p starts with m minus 1. Okay, we just want to make sure it's okay for that particular case. And then we look into this part here. It's the second sentence. Can we say that this is true? Okay, so let's see what is trying to let's let's see what it is trying to express here. If x p okay bit p of x is a zero, and bit p of y is a one then we can make a conclusion that x is in fact less than y. And we're done. The comparison is over because we now have a conclusion. Is that OK? Based on the assumption of the first line. Yes? OK, very good. And then we look at the next one. What if this condition is not true? What if x e xp equals to 0 and yp equals to 0 is false? Then we check for another case. Okay, so we'll, I'm highlighting the sentence that I'm focusing on. Is this okay? Okay, bit p of x is a one, bit p of y is a zero. Um, I'm gonna make a conclusion right here that x is less than y is false. Because given all the other bits, given all the bits to the left hand side of bit p are all the same between these two numbers, this is the first bit that has a difference, right? And the difference is indicating that p, x, p, or the number x or the value represented by x is larger, which also means x is less than y is false. Is that okay? All right. So what if both of these conditions are false? Okay, what if this is false and this is false? Well, that means you know, they are the same. If they are in fact the same, then we have one special condition to check. What if, we, what if we have been looking at bit zero already? In other words, we have seen all the bits between these two numbers. Everything from bit m minus one, which is the most significant bit that is explicitly stored, to the least significant bit, which is bit zero. And we can only get to this point if they are all the same. Right? So what, what, what would be the conclusion? If all the bits of x and y are identical, can I still conclude, can I conclude something out of this comparison? The two numbers are the same, right? But remember, I don't really care, I'm not concerned about whether the numbers are the same. I only want to know whether x is less than y. What is the conclusion? It is false. Very good. So once again, we can say, oh, if we get to bit zero, then we can just come to the conclusion that x is less than y is false because all the bits are the same. Okay, what if none of these conditions are true? Okay, what if this condition is false? This condition is false, which means you know the bits are exactly the same. This condition is false too, which means we have not examined every single bit. Then what we do is we go back to the first step but we first decrement p, so the p is now one less than what it used to be. Then we go back to step one and repeat all those steps. 
is this logic okay? I mean, does it seem okay to be doing a multi-bit comparison of binary numbers representing unsigned values? Seems reasonable to me. Isn't this what you would have done too? How would you how would you manually compare two binary numbers representing unsigned values? Now, most people can use the eyeball algorithm, right? Because you can actually mo process multiple bits at the same time. But if I give you something that is like 2,000 bit long, you can't use that approach anymore. Because <laughs> eyeball algorithm only works up to maybe seven or eight digits at a time. So you will still have to use something. So you're basically scanning from left to right until you find one position where the bits are different, okay? And the only time you can make a conclusion uh, is when well, okay, the only time you can make a conclusion when, is when the two bits are different, and depending on which one has a one and which one has a zero, you come to the first two lines of conclusions. On the other hand, if you have gone through every single bit, then they're all the same, then you come to the conclusion that x is less than y is false, because the two numbers are the same, the two values are the same. Is that okay? All right, okay. So now we're gonna move on and go like, well, do we need this kind of logic implemented in silicon just so that we can compare two unsigned numbers? Okay, do you guys have any questions back there? Any questions for me? Okay, if you don't have a question, you know, um, I want you to stop chatting. Would that be okay? All right. Okay, this makes sense. But it seems to suggest that we need to create more circuitry to compare numbers in the processor, which we don't want to do. So we want to claim the change. We want to make a slight change to the claim. Okay. Um, we want to use this notation here. Uh, v of x is the value represented by the bit pattern of x. V of y is the value represented by y. And we are basically saying x is representing a value that is less than the value represented by y, if and only if. Oh, what is TM here? What is this TM? Which context did it come from? Subtraction. subtraction. Okay, very good. So the borrow bits in subtraction are named T something because I used B for the function already, so I don't want to use B as the name of the borrow bit. So yes, this is the borrow bit, but that is not a typo either. It is M not M minus one. What is TM when you're dealing with with of M, what is TM? Is the is the borrow out right? Okay, the last one, the, the leftover borrow. Okay, so I'm claiming that if TM is a one, then we can make a conclusion that VX is less than VUI, which is great because we already know how to do a subtraction. We know how to get to TM already. Okay. Now, if you're using the carry uh, look ahead mechanism, it can be a little bit messy when M is a large number, but we know the general way of getting to TM. Okay. <clears throat> so the next question is, well, this is a pretty big claim here, okay, that we can just rely on the overall borrow of a binary subtraction to tell us whether the middle end, which is the number, the first number, is less than the supper hand, which is the second number. That's a pretty big claim. Can we prove that is the case? Or at least you know, show some steps to make this you know, reasonable? And the answer is yes, okay? And we start with something that we already know. Okay, if you look at this equation here, okay, I'm just gonna put a pointer here. Um, have we seen this somewhere? Well, you should have seen it somewhere if you had studied a little bit, right? Because we talked about binary subtraction and how binary subtraction is very similar to binary addition. So with, with binary addition, we change all the B's to C's, we change the T to K, and that's for addition. This is for subtraction. B is the borrow function. You guys remember this part? Okay, very good. So now we have to factor this into this whole thing that we have before. Okay, so we will still do the same thing here, the same assumption, okay? 
in addition to just saying that xi equals to yi for all i greater than p, now we're going to say there's a chaining effect here. The chaining effect is um, we are now saying all of those uh, borrowed bits that are more significant depends on tp now. They're all pending, okay? I cannot make a decision up to this point. So all of those carry bit, or excuse me, all of those borrow bits now depend on the borrow bit for bit P. Is that okay? Because everything is un inconclusive up to this point, at least up to this point. So we have the same condition again, which is you know saying that you know the uh, the middle end has a bit of zero, and then the subtract hand has a bit of one. So we are talking about zero minus one in this case. Well, zero is less than one, so that's good. So we have the same conclusion as just like last time. X is less than Y is true, and conclusion is reached. But on top of that, I want to explain why that is the case and what is what that is going to do to T P plus one. Okay? So we look at this equation here, we go like, okay, we're plugging in P in the place of I. That's what we are doing. Is that okay? Now we know XI is a zero. We know yi is a 1. So what is b0, 1? Does anyone remember the borrow function? It is not x and y. Okay? So if the borrow function is not x and y, in this case it becomes not 0 and 1, or not 0, not false and true. What is the result of that conjunction? Zero. True. Okay. Do we care about the second part? Because the second part. Okay. First of all, the second part has got to be. It's got to be false. Okay. Because remember, the borrow function is not x and y. X is true. Not true is false. False and anything is going to be false. So this component is guaranteed to be false. So we know for sure that we are looking at true or false, which is always true, right? So TP plus one is true, which means you know every other borrow flag more significant than this will be true as well, including TM. M is the number of bits of the number. Is that okay? So we have shown you know that okay, this is one way to end the whole process of comparison. And this also shows us why we can use the borrow flag, the overall borrow of a subtraction, to indicate whether a unsigned value is less than the other unsigned value. Is that okay? So this is one way we can come to a conclusion. The other one is really kind of similar. The other one is saying, okay, what if p, uh, bit p of x is a 1, bit p of y is a 0? So if we plug that into here, so we have a 1 here, and a zero here. Okay, so that means you know we are looking at uh, the first one is b one zero, which is false, right? Well, just because this one is false doesn't mean that we can come to the conclusion that the whole thing is false. So we have to look at the second one too. The second one is based on qi. Do you guys remember how Q, what how qi is defined? It's the result of the sum. Which is which we can do with a single exclusive OR gate. Okay, well that relates to your homework, right? The R function can be done with a single exclusive OR gate. Okay, which is which just means you know are the two inputs different? In this case, they are different because one is a one, the other one is a zero. So QI is going to be a one, and then TI is the um, the other borrow bit. But once we know that QI is a one, we also know this entire thing is false. Is that okay? We know the B and then we put a one for X and a question mark for whatever for Y is guaranteed to be false because it is B of X Y is not X and Y. If X is true, not X is false, you know, false and whatever is always false. So now we know this is for sure it is going to be false or false, which means the whole thing is false. So at that point, we backfill all the T's, you know, for all the more significant digits to be false for anything, for all the I's that are greater than P plus 1. Because we just made the conclusion for T, P plus 1, but we also want to propagate 
this conclusion to all the other borrow bits for more significant digits, including TP, TM, okay? So if TM is, has a conclusion already, we're done, because we just want to find you know, out what PM is going to be. Is that okay? So this is the second way for the whole algorithm to stop, but this time making use of the borrow bits to explain. What if P is zero? What if we have exhausted every single bit? Then we'll be looking at T zero, the borrow from bit zero in the subtraction. Now, in your homework assignment, this is an input pin, which means you know, we want to be able to stack subtractions. But in the normal subtraction, this is assumed to be zero because we don't have any less significant digits. So if T zero is already presumed, assumed to be zero, now we have a conclusion too. So we back propagate this zero or the false of T zero all the way back to TM. So TM is false, which means the first, which means the middle end is not less than the subtrahend. That is the conclusion. Is that part okay? In other words, I'm reusing the same logic as before, but this time I'm tying in the logic with what we understand about the borrow bits. Okay. <clears throat> So otherwise, you know, XP and YP are the same, but we have not exhausted all the bits yet. So what do we do? We, ba we basically come to the conclusion that the TP or the borrow bit at bit P cannot yet be determined because we have seen everything being the same up to here from the most significant bit. So what can we do? Well, we decrement P by one and then start to go for the next bit and go like, can we differentiate these two numbers with the next bit? So the whole cycle starts again. Is that okay? So this kind of helps to explain you know, how we can tie in the original logic of a multi-bit comparison with what we know about subtraction and borrows, which proves that the borrow bit can indeed be used to indicate whether the middle end as an unsigned number, unsigned value, is less than the subtrahend as an unsigned value. Are there any questions? You guys don't seem very joyous to me that we got one problem solved. It's like, woohoo! Yes, unsigned numbers are done. And we don't have to do a single thing because we got that borrow bit from subtraction, and that is all we need to determine whether a unsigned middle end is less than a unsigned subtrahend. Then what about signed numbers? Well, as it turns out, they're a little bit more problematic. Okay? So the first thing I want to go through with signed interpretation is how do we look at the value of a bit pattern but interpret it as a um, signed number, okay? All right, so we, we'll take a look at this big equation here, and you, as you can see, in some of the rows, it gets a little bit long, okay? So I want to display this line. This, this row, can people in the back see this? Yes, or do, I, do you want me to scroll up a little bit? This is okay? Okay. They should never put uh, projectors where the bottom of the screen cannot be seen in the back. So I, I put this in as a request uh, when they design a new building that the projectors will be, I mean the projection screen will be placed higher so that even the bottom part of the projected content can be seen all the way to the back without me having to kind of scroll up a little bit. Okay, so what is this saying? Remember, x is still a multi-bit binary number. m is the number of bits to that particular multi-bit number. And, but this time, I'm interested in the signed interpretation. What is the signed value, which is v of x, represented by x, which is a multi-bit number? It has m bits. That's the question. Um, are people, are you guys familiar or comfortable with the use of the question mark and the code. Okay, let, let, me, let me rephrase my question. Okay, I'll start with, are you familiar with so this the operator? Line, it's, hmm? the one, it's like the one line if statement, right? It's the one line if statement for expressions, correct. Okay, so that's one question. The other question I really don't need you guys to answer, which is, you know, are you comfortable with it? I think you know, I, can, I can say 80% of this class is not comfortable. 
<laughs> because it's just not something that your CISP 360 uses a whole lot. Okay, okay so I'm going to explain how it works. And I'm going to use uh, my mouse pad here as a quick and easy whiteboard. So when you have a, this is called a, what is a, what operator are we talking about? Ternary. ternary operator, very good. So when we have a ternary operator, it has three components, A, B, and C. A and B are separated by the question mark, B and C are separated by the code. Okay, so it's a ternary operator because it has got three parts. It is an operator, but it has got three parts to it. But it is basically a if-then-else statement in an expression, okay? So A is a condition. A is a condition, which basically means in C and C++, it is an expression that evaluates to either a zero or a non-zero. If it, if it evaluates to a zero, it is false. If it evaluates to a non-zero, it is true. But that's just A itself, not the entire expression. Okay, so A can be true, A can be false. Question? Anything I can answer? No. Okay. So A can be either true or false. If A is true, then B is evaluated, and whatever B evaluates to becomes the value of the entire ternary operator. Is that okay? Yep. So the question mark stands for if then? The question mark is more like then, and then the colon is more like else. Right. Okay? So if A evaluates to false, which means zero, then C is evaluated, and the value of C is returned as the value of the entire ternary operator. Is that okay? So it is an if then else, okay? You know, if A, then B, else C. Okay, basically that's one way to read it. And it's a very useful operator. Um, you can, it can definitely be abused to make a program really difficult to understand. But at the same time, it can also be used properly to make a program easy to understand. Okay, uh, one particular place that I find you know, to be really useful for this type of expression is when you're passing a parameter to a function where the parameter depends on several things. So that you don't need to copy and paste the entire function call. You just you know, have one of the expressions or one of the parameters or arguments to be replaced by a ternary operator like this then you, you can save a lot of copy and paste. Yep. So okay. how, would you, um, how would you express this in circuits? In circuits? There's no way to express this in circuit unless I know what A, B, and C are. But basically it means you, know, you only choose the output of one of the two expressions. So in a circuit, uh, this one, it, we haven't been introduced to the concept yet, but the multiplexer does this. So A becomes the input to a multiplexer. A multiplexer is, do um, you guys remember Thomas Train? It was a long, long time ago when you were young, okay? So remember in Thomas Train, you know, they have a lot of tracks and there's, uh, some of the tracks is a fork and they can control which way, right? That's what we need here, okay? That's what a multiplexer is, okay? The multiplexer is basically a control mechanism so they can say, okay, we are going for the left, on the right track, okay? And there's such a thing as a circuit uh, in logic called a multiplexer. So you're looking at the result of two calculations where the output of this entire thing picks only one of them, depending on A. So yes, you can do it in a circuit. In fact, we will see that in this class, but not at this time yet. But that, that was a good question. Okay, so now that we know what a ternary operator is, we switch back to the notes and say, okay, but what is this whole mess here? Okay, so the condition of this particular ternary operator is XM minus one. Well, I'm using the typical you know, CC++ shorthand here because there's an implicit comparison to a zero. But I'm just using the bit itself as the truthfulness of this expression. In other words, if the most significant bit of x is a one, this is true. If the most significant, no, most significant bit of x is false, is a zero, this is false. Is that okay? So I look at the most significant bit of a number 
and I have two ways to branch. If the most significant bit is a one, then the value expressed by the by the bit pattern is this huge mass here. Otherwise, if the most significant bit is a zero, then we have a slightly smaller expression. Are we still okay with this whole thing at this point? What each component means. Is that okay? All right, okay. Well, let's take a look at each one and say, why do we have this mess here when the, when the sign bit, okay, the most significant bit is also called the, called the sign bit. If the sign bit is one, why do we have this big mess here? Okay, so we, what we do is we take a look at this, the innermost part, portion first. What is that portion? Just the portion that I highlighted. That, look, that looks just like the unsigned value thing, right? In fact, it is. Okay, it is just the unsigned thing. The unsigned value represented by the bit pattern. But I'm not using it all by itself, is, am I? I'm using two to the power of m minus the unsigned value, and then I take a, a arithmetic negation on the outside. What the? Does it work? Do you guys remember the? Um, the number wheel from last time. Okay, let's let's figure out whether this makes sense or not. Whether we can make a connection between this and the stuff that we talked about last time. So I'm going to open up the document camera, and then we'll take a look at a particular example. Okay, so let's go ahead and make some assumptions here. And we'll say that m equals to 4. In other words, we're limiting ourselves to consider 4-bit numbers. Okay? And we'll say that x is 1, 0, 1, 1. Because x is a bit pattern. Is that okay? And we want to look at what is v of x. What is the value represented by the bit pattern 1011, one, one, and remember this time we are in the context of signed interpretation. Are we doing okay so far with this? Is that okay? All right. So we'll just go ahead and re-express the entire expression here. We want to look at x m minus 1 and then use it to help us make a decision. Okay, blah, blah, versus blah, blah. Okay, there we go. What is m? m is 4, m minus 1 is 3. What is x3 given this is the binary bit pattern? One. 1. The most significant bit is 1, which means we only need to focus on this part here. Because remember, in the ternary operator, this is if, then, and else. The condition is true, so we are only concerned with the then expression. Okay. So now we have to look at that big huge mass of 1 minus 2 to the power of m minus this summation of i going from 0 to m minus 1, xi 2 to the power of i. Okay. Okay. Uh, can someone tell me what this part would evaluate to? It adds up to 11. Exactly. Because we have, okay, let's go through here. We have an 8, no 4, 1, 2, and 1, 1. So they add up, they add up to 11. Fine. Okay. 11 as a value. Okay. Base 10. What is 2 to the power of m in this case? m is 4. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. Okay. So we have 16 minus 11. So the entire thing inside the arithmetic negation is going to evaluate to 5. And then we apply the arithmetic, neg arithmetic negation. So we get negative 5. So now the question is, is this representing negative 5? Is it five steps away from zero when we count in a counterclockwise fashion? Well, let's try that, okay? So we'll go ahead and count from zero, but counterclockwise. Zero, 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 zero. This is the next one. So this is negative one. Negative two. negative 3, negative 4, and then we have negative 5. So indeed, 
according to the number wheel, this is also corresponding to negative five. In other words, that magical thing, the math, magical math equation thing, actually works. <laughs> cool. Okay. So we switch, switch back to the note here. So this works. It's cool. If the sign bit is a zero, then it's, we just add up everything. That works too. So then I derive this one here. Okay. What did I change here? From the first row to the second row is a pretty easy change. Distributed the negative. Yeah, I just you know, apply the negation to the, I distribute the arithmetic negation to the inside and reorder things. That's all I did. Okay. No biggie. And then we move on from the second row to the third row. What, what, what did I change from the second row to the third row? Okay, I better move my mouse pointer away because it's interfering. You put the last element. Yep. So I took the last chunk or the last element of the of the of the sigma of the summation. I take that out, which is x m minus one to the power of the times two to the power of the m minus one. I take that out and apply it over here. But because the second part is inside a inside the subtraction, so whatever I'm adding here becomes a subtraction over there. Okay. So that's what I did from the second row to the third row for the then portion, and then the else portion remains as was, so I didn't change that part at all. Huh? Sorry? Oh, I did. Oh, yeah, I did change that. Okay, I did change it from uh, my m minus one to m minus two. Would that make a difference to the else portion? How? When? When do I evaluate the else portion? When the condition is false, right? What was the condition? The condition is x m minus one. Still, we're going to get there since only a zero. Exactly. So by the time we get to the else portion, we know that x subscript m minus one is a zero. Zero times whatever is always a zero. So I can take it out of the sigma and not really change the value of the sigma. Is that okay? Okay. So moving on, what did I change from the for the then portion from the third row to the fourth row? Then? Okay, so, well, I made use of the condition, didn't I? Because by the time I get to the then expression, x m minus one or bit m minus one of x is guaranteed to be a one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be evaluating the then expression, right? Mm -hmm. So if x uh, subscript m minus one is a one, that means to the power m minus to the power m minus one, I just turn it into one single one like that. Is that okay? Okay, so by the time we get to the then expression, we know that x subscript m minus one is one. Okay, is a one. So that means this is a one. So if you replace this with just one, as a, at least in terms of concept, this is twice the amount of this. So by subtracting one half of itself, we basically just have the other half. Is that okay? It, and I definitely abused the fact that this is in the then expression. Yeah. Okay, which is fine because you know it's guaranteed that x subscript m minus one is a one. Now, why didn't I replace it with just one? Because we know it has to be a constant of one at this point. Well, because the whole idea of this derivation is to merge the expression of the then with the expression of the else. Because I want a single unified expression that can be used for both positive and negative values. That was the whole idea, okay? So now we look at the other side and go like, hmm, can we do this? So we started off with just this part because we know x underscore m minus one is a zero. So I'm just doing something that seems to be pretty stupid here. Because I'm just saying, hey, x underscore, uh, x underscript subscript, m minus one is a zero. So I can always just say, you know, I can subtract 
x subscript m minus 1 times whatever if it doesn't change the value. Does it make sense? Because by the time I get to the else expression, we know that x subscript m minus 1 is a 0. OK? But that is really cool, because now I can just merge the entire thing, get rid of the ternary operator, and just say that this is the value expressed by a signed uh, m bit integer, regardless of whether the sign bit is a 1 or a 0. It works in both cases. Is that OK so far? Can you scroll to the right to see that? Scroll to the right? Sure. <laughs> I can zoom out a little bit too if you guys can handle this font being just a little bit smaller. Is that okay? Okay. And you might be thinking, you know, Tag, you got it from some wiki page, didn't you? <laughs> Well, I challenge you to find it on any wiki page. <laughs> but I like it you know, because it's unified. But it is also useful to discuss, you know, but then how do we do the comparison? Because the comparison is tricky now. Because everything hinges on this bit now. OK? If this bit is a 1, then the whole thing is going to go negative. If this bit is a 0, then the whole thing is going to go positive. So the comparison, the result of the comparison becomes difficult to interpret. Okay. So now we go like, well, maybe we can just utilize you know, something that we already know in arithmetic, which is expressed by these three. Oh, this is, a, this is supposed to align here, but it's just it just it just looks kind of odd, okay, but it's not wrong. Okay. So we look at this derivation here and go like, okay, given that x is less x is less than y. If and only if x minus y is less than y minus y. Makes sense, right? Because I'm just subtracting y from both sides. It doesn't even matter whether y is positive or negative, or whether x is positive or negative, because I'm subtracting the same amount. Is that OK? And that is true if and only if, OK? You know, because I just you know, turn y minus y to a 0. So if x minus y, which is the difference of x and y, is less than 0, then x, we know that x is less than y. Ah, but which bit can tell me whether a difference is less than zero? Well, let's, let's back up one step, okay, just one step. Do we know how to do subtraction? Okay, does the subtraction mechanism work for signed values? Yes, yes because I told you guys, what do you care, right? You know, when we're doing subtraction and, you know, and we look at the number wheel thing, and then we got all confused. Well, I made you con get confused. <clears throat> and then I said, why do you care? Because it works for, for, for signed versus unsigned values, so you don't care, right? So we know that we can do subtraction. Do we know, do we know how to determine whether um, a difference is less than 0 or not? Or any signed value is less than 0 or not? How do we do it? The sign bit, right? You know, in this case, x. Uh, the bit m minus 1 of the difference will indicate whether it is less than 0 or not. Okay, so it seems like you know, all that exercise is really not you know, important okay, because we got the solution. The sign bit is the answer. Well, <clears throat> let's see what the rest has to say about that. So we, I'm skipping to these examples here, and they only work as a 4-bit example, okay, especially the last two. So we are not too concerned about the first five examples, but we are kind of concerned about the, the last two. Well, actually, the fifth one is a problem, too. So we'll take a look at the fifth one as well. OK, okay the fifth one is minus 4 minus 5. Okay, So in this particular subtraction, minus 4 is our menu end, menu end. And then 5, not negative 5, is our subtrahend. Subtrahend. Right? Because the minus sign between the 4 and the 5 is the subtraction operator. It is not the negation of the 5. Are we doing OK? So the question is, 
is negative 4 smaller than 5? The answer is, well, clearly. But is our binary subtraction going to come to the same conclusion? That is what we want to find out. Okay. So we carry out the binary subtraction. First of all, we have to find out how negative 4 is represented. And we got it represented earlier. I think a negative 4 is 1100 zero, zero as a base 2 number. Yes? OK, I can double check. OK, 1, 2, 3, 4. Yep. So negative 4 is, in fact, represented by 1100. Zero, zero. And then we'll go through the subtraction. So 5 is 0101. Zero, zero, one. And we'll do the usual subtraction thing. So this is T0 always assumed to be a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1 minus 0 is a 1. 0 minus 0 is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1 minus 1 is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1 minus 0 is a 1. 1 minus 1 is a 0. And there's no overall borrow. Okay. So can someone point to me where is my where is the sign bit of the difference? This is x, this is y, this is the difference. What is the sign bit of the difference? It would be the most significant bit, right? This guy. And this is telling you the difference is non-negative or negative? It's non-negative. What then? That, that doesn't work, does it? Because when the difference is non-negative, our conclusion should be the middle end is not less than the subtrahend. But clearly, negative 4 should be less than 5. So something went wrong. Well, what went wrong is because the actual value of negative 4 minus 5 is negative 9. And negative 9 is not within the range of values that can be represented by 4 bits. That's it. You just ran out of slots on the wheel to represent the actual result of the subtraction. Okay? And the same thing applies to the other uh, two examples. If you want to carry out 5 minus negative 4, you can tell right away because 5 minus negative 4 is 9. The most positive value we can represent using a four, using four bit using the signed interpretation is seven. So that's going to have the same problem, except it's the opposite around. It's the other way around, which means you know it is supposed to be a zero. Now it's a one. And then the last one, six minus negative five, is going to be exceeding the range as well. Okay, so these three examples, the last three, they will all have the wrong sign. Does that make any sense? But in binary, wrong is relatively right. <laughs> okay? Because if you look at a binary value and you say it is wrong, how many ways can it be wrong? Okay? How many values can a binary number have? It's only two, right? It can either be a zero or a one. Okay? You look at that value, you go like, and I tell you, that is wrong. Can you tell what the right value is supposed to be? It's whatever it is not. Does it make sense? Now, you can't do this trick with normal numbers or normal digits. Because in base 10, if, I, if, you, look at, if, I, if, you, look, if you look at a particular base 10 digit and you say, oh, that's a 5, okay, and I tell you, no, it's not supposed to be 5, they go like, oh, so it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, do you feel lucky today? <laughs> but when you're dealing with binary numbers, that's a one, and I tell you, it's not supposed to be one. It has got to be the other one, because there's only one other possible value. It's a zero. So that is really cool, because if we have a way to say, oh, this subtraction is going to give me the wrong sign, it is as good as giving me the right sign, because if I can tell when it is giving me the wrong sign and what the wrong sign is, I can just say, oh, negate that, and it becomes the right sign again. Does that make any sense? OK, cool. So that particular flag okay, is called the overflow flag. The overflow flag is basically saying the result of a subtraction under sign interpretation 
is wrong. It's got the wrong sign. That's basically what it is. Overflow means the sign of the result of an operation has the wrong sign. Okay. <clears throat> so in subtraction, the only two ways to have an overflow condition is in a subtraction like this, x minus y equals d is when x is less than 0, y is greater than or equal to 0, and you somehow get a difference that is greater than or equal to 0, we know something is wrong, right? Because if you subtract a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity, it should always stay negative. If for whatever reason the bitwise operation gives you a non-negative difference, we know the sign is not right, okay? It should be the other way. And the same thing here, when you, if you start with a positive number and you subtract a negative quantity from the positive number and you somehow end up with a negative quantity, we also know the sign is wrong. Is that okay? Then we look at these things and go like, oh, but how can we tell that x is less than zero? Easy peasy, because the most significant bit of x is the sign bit. So x is less than zero means x subscript n minus one, is a 1. Um, we can apply the same thing to all of the other ones. x is greater than or equal to 0. How can we tell? We look at the most significant bit of y, y subscript m minus 1. If it is a 0, that means y has a value is greater than or equal to 0. Is that, making, is that okay so far? So, so that means in order to evaluate this expression, I don't need anything too fancy. I only have to pay attention to the most significant bits of x, y, and the difference. If I pay attention to the most significant bits of those three components, I can come up with a conclusion. Ah, it's overflow, or no, it's not overflow. Same thing applies to the next row, which is another way to generate an overflow. But nonetheless, I can also just look at the most significant bits of x, y and d and come to the conclusion is it overflowing or not are we are we linking that those expressions to the most significant bits sort of okay so the equation for o or overflow or v sometimes because some people do not yet some people don't like to use uppercase o as a notation because it looks too close to a zero Okay, so there are there are certain you know, textbooks that would use V to stand to represent overflow. Okay, so let me just kind of point out this conjunction here. Okay, so this conjunction is mapping to this conjunction over here. Can everybody see how these two are related? How the assertion of X subscript m minus 1, which is the most significant bit of x, is mapping to x is less than 0, or the value represented by x is less than 0. Is that okay? Because that is, after all, the sign bit. And remember, the sign bit is the one, if it is a 1, the value represented is, a, is less than 0. So what about this one? It's the negation of y subscript m minus 1. It's telling me that y is greater than or equal to 0. The negation of d m minus 1 over here is telling me that d is greater than or equal to 0. So this is one way to overflow, which is represented by this sub-expression. This is the other way to overflow, which is rep represented by the other sub-expression here. Okay? By putting a plus or putting a disjunction between these two, I basically, I'm basically saying there are two ways to overflow. One way is the left hand side, the other way is the right hand side. And that is how the overflow flag is defined. Is, is everything okay so far? This we cannot do using gate logic because it involves actual arithmetic operations, comparisons. This, on the other hand, is easy peasy. Because you know, we just have two AND gates, one OR gate, and then we have certain you know, inputs of the AND gates uh, negated. That's it. Three gates will do this. Is that 
Okay. Any questions up to this point? Any questions? Really? <laughs> I would say we're going at about warp five now. No, no questions. You guys are following? Okay. All right, so with the overflow flag defined, I'm, gonna o I'm also going to define the sign flag, which is represented by uppercase S, and it's nothing more than really just the most significant bit of the operation. And since the operation that we are concerned about is a subtraction, it is the difference, okay? It's the most significant bit of the difference in this context. Is that okay? So between the sign flag, which is the actual most significant bit of the difference, and the overflow flag, which is computed based on the most significant bits of the minuend, subtrahend, and the difference, we have four possible ways to combine those, right? We have the sign flag being a zero, overflow flag being a zero, sign flag being a zero, overflow flag being a one, sign flag being a one, overflow flag being a zero, sign flag being a one, overflow flag being a one. So of all of, all of these four cases, I reasoned out every single one, and it's the middle two that will be indicating that our middle end is less than the subtrahend. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This one is telling us that the actual sign, the sign bit from the bitwise subtraction operation is a zero. But we also know the overflow flag is a one. Remember, when the overflow flag is a one, it's telling us that the sign flag is wrong. Okay? So if the sign flag being a zero is wrong, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be a one. And when the sign flag is a one, how do we conclude? Between the, compa the comparison of the middle end versus the upper end. Okay, we go all the way back to the not so well formatted equation here, right? And it goes back to say that, hey, if the difference is less than zero, x is less than y. The middle end is less than the subtrahend. So scrolling back to where we have here, this means that the middle end is less than the subtrahend. Is that okay? Because the reported sign is a zero, but it is wrong which means the actual, the proper sign should be a one. But if the proper sign is a one, it means the difference is less than zero. If the difference is less than zero, it means the middle end is less than the subtrahend. So we, we can make that conclusion. Are we connecting all the dots? Because you know, there, are this, there are quite a few dots here, and they're kind of spaced out a little bit, but I do want to make sure that we make all those connections. Yes, no, sort of. Slowly. Okay. Okay, so let me see if I can map out those connections. Okay. So the first one is x is less than y if and only if I'm jumping all the way to the conclusion here. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> So if d equals to x minus y, okay, that's just how I define d. Is that okay? d is less than zero if and only if d subscript n minus one equals to one. Are we okay with that? Because d subscript n minus one is the sign bit, and if the sign bit is a one, the value represented by the bit pattern is negative. This whole thing goes back to, okay, so the value of D is uh, sigma I equals to zero to M minus two, D subscript I two to the power of I minus D subscript M minus one times two to the power of M minus one. Do you remember that part? Yes, sort of. Because that's the close form of the value represented by a bit pattern. Yes? 
And, but then you might say, oh, but even if d subsequent f minus 1 is a 1, this entire thing, the sigma minus that thing, may not be negative. But hold on, we have we also proved that 2 to the power of n minus 1 is going to be more than the summation of all the other powers of 2 that are less than it. Remember the, the, the theorem that we proved earlier today that I used induct proof by induction? That is why we have the proof by induction, is to make sure that we understand if d, minus d subscript of m minus 1 is a 1, that whole thing is going to go negative. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. And uh, the actual problem is you subtract 2 above to read the true. Uh huh. The m minus 1, isn't that the 0 bit? That is 0. But that's. But at the same, okay, but that's a, that's a very good thing to do. So in this particular case, so let's take a look at this case here. So we know d m minus one is a zero, right? Which also means sine is a zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what about the overflow flag? The overflow flag. There are two ways to make the overflow flag a one. Let's see whether we get one of those or not. Okay. So the first one is. Okay, let, let me see how I wrote it in the, in the notes first. So the way I wrote it here is non-negated x first. Okay, So non-negated x, so we have x, m minus 1, the negation of y, m minus 1, the negation of d, m minus 1, plus the negation of x, m minus 1, the non-negated y, m minus, m minus 1, the non-negated m, d minus 1. Okay, what about overflow in this case? Is it true or is it false? It's true. It is true. Okay, it is true because this is our um, most significant bit of x. This is the most significant bit of y. This is the most significant bit of the difference. So it meets the first pattern. It turns this whole thing into a true, and because this is a disjunction, that means the overflow is a true. Okay, so we come to the conclusion that overflow is a 1. But what is that telling me? It's telling me that the computed sum is non-negative. But that sign is wrong. So what should it have been? If 0 is wrong and these are all binary, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be a 1. If the sign bit is a 1, it means the number or the value it is representing is less than zero, right? So that's why we can come to the conclusion that negative four is less than five. Because the sign that we got out of the binary subtraction is a zero, but it is wrong. <laughs> okay, but that's but this is, this is my attempt to try to tie in all of the things that we have talked about. So every little thing that we talked about today, they are all kind of interrelated to come to this conclusion. So I'm going to, I have to end the lecture now, because otherwise uh, Professor Fox you know, will have not have enough time to get into the class. So when we get to the lab, I am going to work on the homework assignment. So I'll give you my solution. Um, and kind of briefly describe you know, why I designed it the way that I'm going to design it. Okay? So I'm going to stop the recorder now.